Hello, I'm Doug White, and it's episode 201 of the Security Weekly News. That's right, 201. Welcome to the week of 3 April 2022. We've got VMware, Hydra, MailChimp, Cisco, Pear, Red Hat, GitLab, Creepy Agencies, and Lungworm Tentacle Robots. Yeah, you figure that one out. Along with Jason Wood on this edition of the Security Weekly News. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Cyber criminals are working overtime. Last year in the fourth quarter alone, phishing attacks disguised as COVID testing information increased by 521%. Barracuda has identified 13 types of email threats and how cyber criminals use them to steal money from your company or personal information from your employees and customers. Find out about the 13 email threat types and how Barracuda can provide complete email protection for your teams, your customers, and your reputation. Get your free ebook at securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Monitoring and maintaining compliance is a never-ending struggle with a high price of failure. Firemon helps customers meet complex and varying compliance requirements. Firemon has fully customizable reporting, analytics, assessments, and dashboards to meet the compliance needs of any organization. With Firemon, compliance reports take a tenth of the time, and real-time continuous compliance eliminates the anxiety and headaches of audit preparation. Improve security outcomes by improving security operations with Firemon. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Firemon to learn more. All right, uh, now the news. Spring for Shell, uh, which you probably heard of, is a remote code execution vulnerability. It, it's actually several uh, in Spring Core Java Framework. And basically, this is a, uh, a vulnerability which would allow the system to be exploited without authentication. Uh, the total severity score on this thing is 9.8, and there's been lots and lots of stories about it. We've talked about it before. But basically, if somebody has access to a component which is vulnerable to this, meaning it has that library being used, well, they pretty much own you. Uh, the vulnerability expect, uh, affects Spring MVC, Spring Web Flux, Flux apps, which are running on JDK uh, Plus 9. Uh, it also requires that the application be running on a Tomcat server as a war deployment. And all that sounds like an awful lot of things that have to be in place for this to happen, but that's used a lot. So it's not like that is a very rare thing. Uh, but basically, this is another one of those library flaws that may be embedded in a whole lot of different things without maybe you even know that it's there or that it's being done behind the scenes and so forth. But this particular story... Uh, we've talked about Spring for Shell before. This one was for VMware users who are running VMware's Tanzu application service, Tanzu Operation Manager, or Tanzu Kubernetes Grid Integrated Edition. And that is a mouthful. Um, VMware has issued patches now for some of the components, and they do have workarounds attached as well as the patches in this article. So there's, there's a link to all these patches and workaround. So if you are using VMware Tanzu of, of any sort, or even if you're using VMware, it's probably not a bad idea to go check this out immediately because it is being exploited in the wild. It is on the CISA list. It, it, it is being compared to all sorts of other things like Log4j and so forth. So it is a very, very large exploit problem that is embedded in lots and lots of different stuff. And, but the VMware Tanzu stuff was, was on that particular story. Hydra Market is probably the most prominent Russian darknet location for drugs, money laundering, whatever. Kind of like Ninth Avenue at the Port Authority in 1980. Um, but anyway, uh, the German police have now pursued a case against Hydra, and they've seized their assets. And so that included infrastructure and anything related to the operation of Hydra market, and they apparently have shut it down, essentially. Uh, now, we've, of course, we've seen this before with stuff like Silk Road and so forth. So, you know, we all know by now that when you go down and you arrest everybody on the corner of, of you know, 40th and 9th Avenue or something and, you know, pull all them in, uh, they'll just reappear later somewhere else. So I'm sure there's plenty of dark websites for you to buy all your substances from. But anyway, they seized all the infrastructure they could get and 543 Bitcoin from Hydra's profits, which tells you something about the profits that they were making. Uh, the market uh, supposedly had 19,000 registered seller accounts, 
with 17 million customers being that were that were registered in this system. Um, which is exciting. Is it really the dark web anymore if you have customers and marketing? And I mean, really? But anyway, the German authorities estimated that the Hydra market had a turnover of 1.35 billion U.S. dollars in 2020, which kind of would make it the large, largest dark net that is you know, out there, the biggest site. Uh, I, I think I need to get into crime. Uh, I mean, wow. Uh, but anyway, the German police say they conducted a lengthy investigation against the operators of Darknet. So far, they have not released any information on if any people were arrested or if they were able to seize the entire operation or it was just some small part of it that was running in Frankfurt. So yet, yet to be determined. MailChimp is an email marketing firm that is very well known. And they announced on Sunday that they had been attacked and that the attackers had gained access to internal customer support and account management tools, which allowed them to steal audience data. Not sure what audience data means, but I, you know, it was, it was in quotes in the article, so I'm not sure. And that people that were using MailChimp uh, should be expecting phishing attacks. Trezor, which is a hardware crypto wallet company, uh, and, and all their customers began receiving spear phishing notices almost immediately that claimed that Trezor had been breached. So this was an announcement that went out to customers of Trezor, and the link uh, in the email, of course, said, you know, you need to reset your password, you need, to do, you need to reset your PIN number and all this other stuff. And, of course, people that clicked on that link and reset their PIN numbers basically gave up their original PIN numbers and their account and their wallet information to the attackers. And, you know, so basically the attackers then went in and were stealing people's money. Uh, according to MailChimp, some of their employees got social engineered, uh, nothing new there, and that resulted in them losing their credentials. Uh, so, you know, and obviously those were people with administrative rights. The attack was noticed by MailChimp on the 26th of March. They said that 319 accounts were accessed and that, again, audience data was taken from 102 accounts. I, it probably means something to, to MailChimp users, but I don't really know what they meant by that, and it didn't say. Uh, they did announce that all the victims had been notified that they were aware of. Uh, the attack was being compared to lapses breaches that occurred at NVIDIA, Samsung, Microsoft, and most recently Okta, but the attacker was not known. There's no attribution at this time. Cisco Nexus dashboard fabric controller. Say that real fast three times. Cisco Nexus dashboard fabric controller. <laughs> Some of these names. Uh, but anyway, Cisco Nexus dashboard fabric controller was found to have an unauthenticated remote code execution bug. So Pedro, uh, Pedro Rebiero discovered this flaw and built an exploit to take advantage of it as a, you know, an illustration or a proof of concept. The flaw was basically able to allow him to get to a level of root shell on that device. The fir it was a series of bugs as usual, but the first bug was a Java deserialization vulnerability that was in an old library. So that's the underscored part of my notes. Uh, it was a deserialization vulnerability in an old library, and then another old Java library, which allowed the code execution as an unprivileged user. The last piece of this attack was a misconfigured pseudo setup, which allowed Pedro to escalate to root. Yeah, I mean, it's like, here we go again with all this, you know, this is embedded in that, is embedded in this other thing, and all those libraries and other libraries and other libraries that call this Lambda and that all have, you know, they're beginning to have these elaborate vulnerability chains and allowing these kind of attacks to be assembled. Cisco did release an update for this on the 4th of March and issued a thank you to Pedro for reporting the vulnerability. But, so the reason this story was here now, Ribeiro then went public as soon as they acknowledged it and he put the proof of concept up and he published a blog entry on GitHub last week about it. Uh, but he was pretty na negative about Cisco and he said that six months was not the best, uh, the best uh, you know, turnaround on this kind of patch, and that the only information now about the bug is behind a registration wall. Now, if you've ever dealt with Cisco, everything is behind a registration wall, it, at least in my experience. Every time they, they say, go here to get this that you need, and then I go there and I, you know, there's yet another level of registration I'm required to have on another site and another site, and oh, I don't have this service contract and on and on. But anyway, Pedro also said that there is no mention now of this bug in their global security center database, and that six months is a really long time to fix something like this. So pretty, uh, a lot of condemnation there. In that same light, PHP Package Manager Pair 
uh, was found to have vulnerabilities, which had been in the manager for more than 15 years. Yeah. Uh, these apparently were recently patched, but pair developer accounts were exposed by a flaw which involved weak entropy on the password reset function. Uh, and that was from Sonar Source. A second vulnerability in an outdated version of a bundle dependency. See, we keep saying this a lot. An outdated version of a bundle dependency, which had another dependency inside of it, which also had a flaw, uh, allowed for the attackers to then establish persistent access to the system. So again, it's a chain of vulnerabilities that are being used. A compromise of the pair repository would have allowed an attacker to hijack uh, pretty much anything hosted on the platform and push out malicious releases that look like they're regular, you know, legitimate updates through Pair. So if you've not used this with PHP, uh, it's a lot like uh, apt or apt. I don't know how people say that one, but uh, on uh, on Ubuntu and Yum and some of these other package managing or pip or any of these other package manager tools, uh, Pair is no longer the top package manager in PHP, but it is still widely used. Net SMTP and mail packages had around 100,000 downloads a month through Pair. So this is just another case of these libraries within libraries. And uh, if you want all the grim details of this compromise, they are in the article. They, they walked all the way through exactly what was going on and what was happening. So definitely check that out if you're interested or you're a Pair user. Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8.2. Uh, it achieved something that's kind of rare, actually, common criteria certification. Um, what that means is that the, that particular version, 8.2, is cleared to be a platform which can be used by classified and sensitive deployments in the United States government. And, of course, obviously this is a big deal because there's a lot of these things and there's very few operating systems that are actually in compliance with this. The National Information Assurance Partnership, the NIAP, is a government program in the United States which oversees evaluation and validation of any kind of off-the-shelf products to determine if they can actually be used in a classified, secret, et cetera, environment. So again, they're very powerful because if you want your software to be adopted by any of these kind of organizations within the U.S. government, they have to pass these certifications. Uh, the, the version that they certified, however, in my opinion, was released in April of 2020. So it's a long process. Uh, the current beta of Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux is, is 8.6. And they have announced that Enterprise Linux 9 is an early beta as well. So, you know, by the time they actually get these things certified, they're quite a bit out of date. Supposedly that won't matter because it was so heavily certified that it should be, you know, free of flaws. But, you know, now it's like, okay, we're not using the latest editions. And that's why you end up with systems that are running stuff that's 10 years old. And everybody's going, wow, this is weird. Um, but Red Hat was developed by Mark Ewing in 1994 and is one of the more popular commercial versions of Linux. I used to use it before it was commercial and you had to pay for it. So uh, they do have a non-pay version called Fedora, but that's not certified. GitLab pushed out security updates for three versions of GitLab Community Edition and Enterprise Edition on Friday. These new releases fixed a number of serious flaws in the product, with one of them being uh, critical, two high, nine medium, and four low severity vulnerabilities. Basically, the most serious one was a hard-coded password flaw, which was set for accounts that were registered using an OmniAuth provider like OAuth, LDAP, and SAML. Um, so, you know, hard coded passwords don't stay secret for very long and pretty soon, well, somebody will publish it or publish the method for computing it. And then it's all over the password module they were using was generating a fake strong password for testing and it was predictable. So it was something that was reproducible. And so, uh, you know, you can pretty much guess what happened then, but, uh, the fixed password was used to take over accounts that were created by OmniAuth. GitLab is urging users to upgrade to a current version uh, GitLab claims to have 30 million registered users worldwide, a million active licensed users, and more than 100,000 organizations using their software. So if you are using it, be sure you patch. The United States announced that the State Department was launching the Cyberspace and Digital Diplomacy Bureau. Another one. We have, this was like hard to say names today. Uh, the group was established to deal with national security challenges and assess the implications of cyberspace and digital technologies. <laughs> and and I, some of these, these statements they release, I, I love them. I was like, did somebody write this or what? But the primary focus is to promote responsible cyberspace behavior and policy. Now I'm going to give you the actual State Department quote. The State Department said, quote, 
the Bureau addresses the national security challenges, economic opportunities, and values considerations presented by cyberspace, digital technologies, and digital policy, and promotes standards and norms that are fair, transparent, and support our values, whatever that means. And I never saw a sentence with so many commas, but, but they sure work through it. Uh, there are three policy units within this bureau, digital freedom, international cyberspace security, and international information and communications policy. It sounds like something out of 1984, but, you know, anyway. Well, when he's not creating controversy in the cybersphere, he creates controversial soundscapes. His first series of recordings called Secret Mutterings of a Guy Named Mari on the one train at 4 a.m. is considered a classic of late-night hobo subway recordings, and his sounds made by a guy passed out in an alley won an International Aural Soundscape Award in Cannes. Please welcome Jason Wood. Hey, everybody. As always, it is good to be with you. Um, this one I decided to change up a little bit. I, and I would talk about all kinds of, I don't know, ransomware or, or uh, different things happening in the political world or whatnot that overlap with cyberspace or cybersecurity. Gosh, I can't believe I just said that. Anyhow, um, I saw, so I decided... I saw something that I was like, hey, this looks kind of cool. Let's take a look at um, something a little more technical. And and basically, I found a blog post uh, written by Johannes Ulrich uh, on the Sands Internet Storm Center uh, blog. And, you know, this caught my attention for a couple reasons. One, I, you know, I spend my time looking at intrusions all the time by by different adversaries and attackers. And, and so another chance to take a look at it, get a little bit different telemetry that I'm used to seeing, I thought was, it was interesting. Now, this is a very much a scripted type of attack. It's basically a coin miner interacting with a honeypot. Um, but I, you know, I still I just kind of enjoy this. So let's just kind of dive into what, you know, a little bit about what an attack, a common attack right now looks like. In this case, uh, he noticed a host uh, that he, uh, did some looks up on. It looks like it had been scanning um, the internet for quite a while, for several weeks, for vulnerable web logic hosts. And so, uh, you know, he saw the, it interacting with his honeypot and trying to uh, exploit one of two possible vulnerabilities. He, as he's speculating, is CVE 2020. 14882 or CVE 2020-14883, both of which relate to issues with WebLogic. And you know, I see a fair bit of attacks against WebLogic servers myself, so this is definitely something adversaries are absolutely using. In this case, it's just a simple coin miner. Uh, the first thing that I noticed here that I thought was interesting is you're seeing two different hosts involved with this that, you know, one is kind of leaning on the other. We've got one that's doing the scanning for port 7001 and then trying to execute uh, a command essentially through it to download and, and run a payload uh, from that's hosted on a second IP address. So you've got this kind of interaction here between the host. We've got the scanner and then we've got the downloader uh you know, site where where the attackers go to get their their script. Um, so what you see happening is it's a, basically an HTTP POST request. He's got the 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 POST requests and some of the payload uh, up on the blog. Uh, and as part of this, um, you know, it just it's just a simple hey, if this works, go download this command, uh, the script that is cleverly named wb.sh. So no particular points for creativity on script names, but you know it is very concise. Download the URL. Um, now I, there are a couple of things I saw in the HTTP request that I thought would be potentially useful for monitoring if you're you know you have the inspection of like uh, either it's in clear text or if you have inspection of TLS traffic you know configured for your environment. Uh, basically, it's a uh, is it's hitting this, this web logic server? It's making an XML request. In this XML request, there are uh, there's one section of C data that is basically a command to ta you know one liner to drop into a shell and have be executed. Uh, it basically uses curl minus s and then has the URL to wb.sh. And then if that succeeds, it pipes it over to Bash for execution. If that fails, there's actually two vertical pipes in there as a or statement. So if the first one fails, we'll go ahead and do the second one. We'll run wget, 
Uh, also, it'll be downloading or executing silently. And then if that works, that'll pipe it over to, to Bash. Now, uh, this is gonna be kind of, these are things that would be kind of unusual to see in an environment. Maybe you have an application that does something like this, but uh, typical environments, you're not going to be seeing your WebLogic web logic server running curl uh, with an or statement you know, that includes wget, and then all of this gets piped out to bash. Or any download command that gets piped out to bash is probably going to be more unusual. So to me, I looked at that and said, hey, here's an opportunity for, you know, my put on my threat hunting hat and say, hey, here's a, here's a hunting lead. Let me put this into my program. I see anything in my tools that gives me this kind of visibility. Now, you can catch this on the network side. if Or if you have the endpoint capturing command lines, you would see, you know, the attempts to execute the command line end of it if it was actually to be successful. So that's something you could, you know, turn around, plug right into a hunting program. Uh, definitely, you know, I'm an advocate of getting out there, not waiting for something to tell me, hey, you've got a problem. Go look for it. And, and, and um, there's a lot of value in hunting and, and being proactive and, and trying to find signs of you, that you're under attack. Now, since this was a honeypot, it happily downloaded wb.sh and executed it. And since it's a coin miner, the name of this game is all about system resources. We want all the resources. So the first thing it does is it changes the uh, limit basically on how many file handles uh, a process can request, bumps that up to 65,535, and then uses the, the chatter or C-H-A-T-T-R command to basically change the file system attributes of on the slash temp and slash var temp directories. And this, this the switches here basically uh, tell it, you know, hey, uh, let's make some things where files can only be opened in a pen mode. If they're deleted, we can request an undelete and get the files restored back, as well as making the directories somewhat immutable or not changeable. Um, and then it goes on to, you know, this is obviously, again, aimed at the idea of making the life harder for the defender. Uh, it goes on to try and then disable a number of local security controls, things you would typically find on a Linux system. Where it pivots from there was kind of interesting because it got into trying to kill uh, monitoring software for Alibaba Cloud. Uh, and just that particular bit of software. Maybe that's related to where he's hosting his honeypot. Uh, Ulrich is honey, hosting his honeypot. Um, but, you know, obviously the goal here, hey, no, we want to interfere with monitoring so that nobody notices that the CPU just went to max throttle because that's what's going to happen with a coin miner. Uh, they want this thing running as long as they can, taking up as many resources as they can because it's certainly going to get noticed at some point. And then, you know, once it hopefully kills off the monitoring software, then it starts to try and kill off other processes that might want to use some CPU time themselves. And so then it starts going after those via name or ports that it's, it's going. So just running kill commands. Nothing very exciting here uh, as far as or unusual uh, as to the type of commands, but just a list of them going through. And then what I did find interesting is it looked specifically for any Docker uh, processes and tried to kill those as well. So that's a little bit of a new trick here is apparently they're running into Docker being more common. So we need to get that out of here so that it doesn't have access to the CPU. Finally, when all of this is done, it downloads the miner and sets, executes it and sets it up to run, uh, have some persistence with a really simple cron job. It'd be very obvious to see. Um, a lot of this isn't terribly elite or difficult type of stuff to do. Uh, but what I thought was interesting was just, you know, one, we've got it going after the cloud monitoring software. We've got it going after Docker. That's a little bit of a change there from what I typically see in intrusions. Uh, or, Ulrich noted that it didn't go after any security monitoring software that isn't native to the operating system. Uh, this is something that I do see in a number of intrusions. A lot of times they're going to go after UFW, our, um, SC Linux. Uh, on the Windows side, they'll try and disable Windows Defender in particular, but they'll also go after third-party applications uh, or security controls, you know, some kind of EDR or whatnot, and try and kill those processes as well because they don't want it interfering with their execution. None of that occurred here, uh, but I do see this happen. So if you're, you know, as you're setting up this tooling, make sure you're configuring it properly so that it can resist attacks or attempts to uninstall it without uh, providing, you know, 
long and strong passwords and stuff like that. Yeah, the adversaries definitely want to maintain their 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 foothold into an environment, regardless of what their motives are. This one's very simple, an automated type of thing. Uh, but somebody goes hands on, they want to stay under the radar as well. And so you'll see them doing that that sort of stuff. Um, so you know, it, it can be really interesting. It can be it can be really simple like this. If you're looking at the you know an attack like uh, what Johannes is documenting, but I've seen others that are much more clever, and it just kind of depends on the skill and the goal of the adversary. In the end, I bring this up mostly because it's a good opportunity to learn a little bit more about how threat actors or attackers are doing what they do. And in this case, we've just got a simple coin miner, but these things are running all over the place. So you can go take a look at this, see what happens. Uh, use it as a source of hunting leads. Hey, how would my environment do at detecting this? Um, and, and just kind of evaluate how this is going. Uh, it's also kind of refreshing to just kind of look and say, hey, here's something for me to just read that's just technical. There's no you know, overarching doom and gloom. Let's just, you know, learn a few things. And, you know, I particularly enjoy trying to read and stay up on what uh, attackers are doing. So this is just another example of that. I think it's valuable. Uh, go ahead and get your hands dirty a little bit. Take a look at it. Maybe you want to go in and you, you would want to consider the idea of, hey, what can I do to set up, you know, my own honeypot somewhere, not inside your corporate network or anything like that necessarily, but in some place where you can get a view into this type of activity. Um, so, you know, I would just recommend taking a few minutes, go refresh and, uh, and read something fun here. Uh, you know, Dr. Ulrich has, has provided a nice write up here on some simple activity, very easy to follow and, and see what threat actors up to. All right. Thank you, Jason. Uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. I like to build those kind of things myself. So uh, they're, I, I like honey pots. I've built quite a few of them and uh, all that kind of stuff. So is, uh, yeah, getting your hands dirty. It's fun. Uh, and finally, researchers in the UK have put together an autonomous robot that is very snake-like and is designed to go places, well, they said your lungs, uh, but you know, places that are hard to reach. The robot is called, and I love the name, the Magnetic Tentacle Robot. And it uses two millimeter thick discs. So, uh, you know, in each disc, and, and then the, the article goes that each disc is a tenth of an inch long. I'm like, why are you mixing these things together? I hate it when they do that. It's like, pick one, a tenth of an inch. What the hell is that? I mean, 0.1 inches is about 2.5 millimeters. So if you're going to say 2 millimeters, why not just say 2.5 millimeters for the other part? Or you could just switch between all these and say how many rods there are in a mile or all that kind of stuff. But anyway, the discs are 2 millimeters by 2.5 millimeters, which is really, really small, right? I mean, that, that, like 2 millimeters, like two little ball, those little uh, razor pin nibs together. So this thing is really, really small. And here's what it does. It can slither down into your lungs or, I guess, other places, I mean, that it could slither to. But it's autonomous. So they're going to put this in you, and it's like that scene in Star Trek, you know, where, where uh, uh, you know, where they're putting the, the worms in the guy's ears. And, you know, it's like, yeah, and Chekhov's going, oh, they put insects in our bodies. Yeah, yeah, it was really creepy. But they said the robot was actually five to ten years away from being used in a clinical setting. But it may allow the replacement of things like bronchoscopes or bronchioscopes which are much bigger, like four millimeters, than the tentacle robot. So, you know, what do you want jammed down your throat? A four millimeter bronchioscope or a tentacle robot? I don't know. Depends on your worldview. And hey, we're not judging anybody. But honestly, if they want to sell this, it's going to have to have a better name. Magnetic tentacle robot just sounds like a fun party to get invited to, but it's not really a piece of medical equipment. So I'm sure it's going to end up being called something like the two millimeter thoracic spindle or something like that in practice. But it still looked cool. So amaze your friends with this fun surprise in a box. And that's the news. Thanks, Jason. And I'll see you on Friday with the wrap up show. 